every one of us, a belief that we'd lose at least uh, one, possibly even more astronauts uh, during the, uh, the Mercury program. The risks were incredibly high. You know, when we put John Glenn on board a rocket, he was flying the sixth Atlas and two of the previous five had blown up. As Friendship 7 finally lifted off the pad at 9.47 that morning, Capcom Scott Carpenter had the last word. Godspeed, John Glenn. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3. Glenn was falling around the Earth at nearly 18,000 miles an hour. 12 minutes after liftoff, he was over Africa. As he traversed the night sky over Australia, residents of Perth blinked their lights to say hello. Uh, Roger, the lights show up very well, and I'll thank everybody for turning them on, will you? Sure will, John. Oh, well, hey, over. Uh, Roger, how you doing, Gordo? We're doing real fine up here. Everything is going very well. Very good, John. You sound good. Roger. That was sure a short day. Time passes rapidly, huh? Yes, sir. Half a world away in mission control, there was sudden cause for concern. An indicator suggested that Glenn's inflatable landing bag was deployed. Located just beneath his heat shield, a problem with the bag meant the shield itself might be loose. In which case, Glenn would flash into vapor during the 9,000 degree re-entry through the atmosphere. As he passed into his second sunrise of the day, Glenn knew none of this. He was transfixed by thousands of what looked like fireflies dancing in the sunlight just outside his window. Hypnotically beautiful, their origin a complete mystery. Glenn excitedly reported his findings, trying to accurately and dispassionately describe what he was seeing. Nobody below seemed very interested. Passing over Australia, Glenn asked on-site Capcom Gordon Cooper to mark him down as having logged the four hours of flight time he needed to qualify for February's flying bonus. The $245 would be added to his monthly salary of $904.68. In mission control, the decision was made to bring Glenn down at the end of his third orbit. We made a uh, very uh, risky decision to uh, re-enter with the retro rocket package attached because the retro rocket had straps that would hold the heat shield in place until the uh, aerodynamic pressures in reentry would maintain it in that position. So that was a very close call. Now Glenn demanded to know what was going on. Alan Shepard advised him that he was to perform a manual reentry with the retro pack attached. And then he told him why. I was more concerned that we were going to cause damage to the heat shield by the, having the pack on there as much as I was worrying about it coming off.
creates an ionized layer around the spacecraft that radio waves can't penetrate. Mission Control and the world would have to endure four minutes of silence without knowing whether Glenn had made it through. The main chute is on green. Chute is out in reef condition at 10,800 feet and beautiful chute. In the end, the problem had been neither landing bag nor heat shield, just a bad indicator light in mission control. John Glenn had earned his bonus with a perfect flight that had held America riveted since early that morning. The New York ticker tape parade would be larger than the one that greeted Lindbergh 35 years earlier, but that was still to come. For now, John Glenn stood alone on the deck of the recovery ship Noah, contemplating his fourth sunset in just over five hours. There were three more Mercury missions planned, each with dangers that would be all too real, but that too was still to come.